All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here with us today. Welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series for the Federal Community. This speaker series is hosted by the White House Office of Federal Chief Sustainability Officer within the Council on Environmental Quality. I'm Michelle Hawkins, Director for Strategic Initiatives, and I am really pleased to be here with you all today. I am a 14-year Fed myself in the Department of Commerce in NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administ and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and this work is near and dear to my heart and central to the work that I do every day. So I am really pleased about this seminar series and thank you all again for joining us today. So I'm gonna go over just a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, this webinar is being recorded and the recording as well as information on future speaking events can be found on our website, sustainability.gov. Also, we will not be using the raise hand feature today, although there will be an opportunity to ask questions and Kat, Dr. Hayhoe is gonna go through the process for how to do that. We did receive questions during the webinar registration process and we will be going through those questions or <laughs> questions as well. So again, thank you for joining us. And now I'm gonna hand it over to the Federal Chief Sustainability Officer, Andrew Mayock. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us and Catherine uh, for kicking off the speaker series. It's a great way to start. As we kick off here, I have a couple slides I'd like to share uh, with the audience as we uh, take a step back and take a look at the sustainability plan that we just launched one month ago. And are you seeing that Michelle and Catherine? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, it's coming. Um, so as it comes up. There we go. There we go. Um, we've got a couple slides to explain uh, a few words about the sustainability plan and about, about who we are. So as Michelle noted, the Office of the Federal Chief Sustainability Officer resides in the White House, in the Council on Environmental Quality. And that means that we help lead uh, sustainability and adaptation for the federal government, along with numerous partners, including our colleagues inside the White House at the DPC, the NEC, NSC, OMB, and OSTP, as well as uh, our agency partners throughout the federal government uh, through the CSO Council on a bilateral basis with uh, numerous colleagues who co-lead this effort overall. The sustainability plan as noted, which was launched on December 8th through an executive order, uh, did a few things. In the big picture, it put the federal government on track for net zero emissions by 2050. And it did that by identifying the major levers that we need to pull in order to get there. That includes zero emission vehicles, that includes carbon free electricity, um, uh, smart buildings, net zero emission buildings as we move forward, uh, a new approach to uh, green procurement, uh, which are outlined on this slide as we take a look at the, the, the major pieces in that circle. Those are supported and sustained and enabled by a number of uh, uh, key operating or enabling goals. Um, one, leveraging domestic and international partnerships, which we were doing earlier today through a, uh, a convening that we held through the Greening Government Initiative, which brought over 50 countries together and over 100 representatives of those countries to collaborate on the work that's on this slide. Uh, two, by advancing environmental justice and equity and integrating it in all that we do. And number three, which is what we're doing here today, is mainstreaming sustainability within the federal workforce. So we have the um, overall plan and its major pillars. We have its enabling uh, uh, pillars in this structure on the side. And then we click into um, the near term versus the long term. And as President Biden has um, charged us and reminds us on regular occasion that the 2020s is an essential decade of action. And we start that action now. We started in 2021 in earnest and have been leaning in uh, throughout all of last year and here as we kick off 2022. And what does that mean for us as feds and federal operations? It means uh, moving our uh, largest fleet in the world, the federal, federal fleet to zero emission vehicles fully and doing that by moving our light duty vehicles 
um, acquisition to 100% zero emission vehicles no later than 2027. It means changing our uh, consumption of electricity for federal operations from the current 40% carbon-free electricity to 100% no later than 2030 and making at least 50% of that uh, on a 24-7 basis. And, and a number of other near-term goals as we, as we do the work of this week and this month and move out throughout the year to really lay the foundation and, um, and start making progress across each of these goals as we move forward. As noted on that first slide of the plan, do, we're, we're, we're modeling and acting here uh, on a key pillar. And that was um, communicated through the sustainability plan if you didn't get a chance to see it through a letter to all of us as federal employees from the president that's at the um, front of the plan. And you'll be able to see that at sustain, sustainability.gov if you haven't had a chance. And the big idea here is how we foster a culture of sustainability um, and climate action, how we train up and staff up in order to meet this moment together and how we integrate it to the work that we do. And part of this federal employee engagement as noted is to do what we're doing today, which is to uh, identify folks who can come and speak to us, who have uh, inspiration, who have knowledge, um, who can help us focus for a moment on this work that we're doing and help us step back to from the work that we're doing um, as part of the overall approach here. And so we're seeking to enhance sustainability and climate literacy through this work. We're seeking to learn how we can uh, lean in a little more and get a little bit more done uh, on our sustainability plan. And um, that's the essence of the, the, the discussion we're gonna have today with Dr. Hayhoe. Um, and we're looking forward to the second speaker who uh, Dr. Bill Nye will join us in April. Uh, stay tuned for more information on that. And that will be the, the second of the speaker series. But most of all, we're super excited here today to have Dr. Catherine Hayhoe join us. Um, and I will stop the share here. Uh, bring Catherine on and again and, and note um, a couple things. Uh, Dr. Hayhoe is an accomplished atmos atmospheric scientist who studies climate change and why it matters to us here and now. She's a distinguished professor and endowed chair in public policy and public law in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University. And she's also the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, in her spare time, she's also served and led as an author on the second, third, and fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment. She's received numerous uh, distinguished awards and has been named to a number of prestigious lists. Um, most of all, as I've had the opportunity in the past to um, experience Catherine, Catherine's discussions and presentations, um, she's a master communicator on what can be a really um, difficult, sometimes charged uh, issue that we manage and navigate and work through every day. And so uh, a real opportunity today to gain her wisdom, to gain her insight. And with that, we welcome Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. It is such a pleasure to be with you all here today. So um, as Michelle mentioned, we are going to be taking your questions, but the way we're going to be doing it is a little bit unusual and also fun. You have to go to polyv.com slash Catherine, my name, spelled with two A's. And what you can do there at any point throughout my presentation is you can write your question or you can upvote somebody else's. We have 2,700 people on this call. <clears throat> so we're not gonna have time to take all the questions. But by going there and putting your question in and upvoting the questions that you most want us to get to, Andrew and I will be taking your questions at the end of my presentation. So at any point, you can go to pollev.com, that's P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash Catherine. No need to enter your name, anonymous is fine. And you can put in your question and you can see the other questions that other people have put in. And if you click on top, you can see them in order of the ones most upvoted at any time. <clears throat> so I am a scientist, so I am going to begin with the science of what we know, but then I'm going to move to why it matters and end with what we can do about it. The way I think about it is this, we start with the head, we move to the heart, and then we end with the hands. How do we spur action on this critical issue? 
Because make no mistake, it is very critical. As far back as we can go in the history of our planet, we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly. We are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home that we have. How are we conducting this experiment? By digging up and burning massive amounts of coal and gas and oil that produce heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. And today our planet is running a fever. It is already a full degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it should be otherwise. <clears throat> How long have we known about this? For a really long time. These are not photos of people's family members dressed up in old timey outfits taken in black and white to make them look old. These are the real photos of the real scientists, or in some cases, drawings, who put together the pieces, understanding that uh, heat trapping gases in the atmosphere cause the planet to rise, that these gases are being produced by fossil fuel emissions. And Guy Callender at the end, he was the first one to actually document how the world was getting warmer already in 1938. So it's no surprise that scientists were concerned enough about this issue to formally warn a US president of the risks of climate change in 1965. That president was Lyndon B. Johnson. So you might say, if we've known about it for so long, what's new today? Well, there are definitely some things we know today that we did not know 50 or 100 years ago. We know that the warming that we're experiencing, and this is a figure from the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out this past August, we know that our current warming is unprecedented. Over the course of human civilization, the temperature of the planet has been as stable as that of the human body. Our human body temperature goes up and down by a few degrees over the course of a day. The average temperature of the planet has gone up and down by a few degrees over, or a few tenths of a degree, I should say. Our body temperature goes up and down by a few tenths of a degree. The average temperature of the planet has gone up and down by a few tenths of a degree over the course of human civilization. Until when? Until the last hundred years. And just like your body would, if your body was running a two degree Fahrenheit temperature, you'd say something's wrong. In the same way, something is wrong with our planet. We also know today that our heat trapping gas emissions come from almost every sector of the economy. This figures from the EPA, showing how almost every activity we engage in today produces heat trapping gases. What else do we know? We also know that the impacts are here. They are no longer distant or in the future. We know that climate change is literally taking our weather dice and loading those dice against us. Wherever we live, we always have a chance of a flood, a drought, a wildfire, a winter storm, a tropical cyclone or hurricane. But decade by decade by decade, as this figure from NOAA shows, those numbers have been steadily ticking upwards. Why? Because decade by decade as the planet warms, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking our natural weather dice and taking one of those numbers and turning it into a six and taking another number and turning it into a six and then taking another number and turning it into a seven. And so all of a sudden you look around, you say, how did the city of Houston have three 500 year flood events in three years? The answer is climate change is loading our natural weather dice against us. It's making some events more frequent, some more intense and all of them more dangerous. We see this with more intense droughts, more dangerous heat waves, bigger wildfires, stronger and wetter hurricanes, or cyclones and typhoons as they call them in other parts of the world. And at the very cutting edge of climate science today is the ability to put numbers on just how much worse climate change made a given event. Now, we've always had hurricanes, droughts, floods, heat waves, wildfires, and more. But as climate change makes wildfires burn greater area, increases the rainfall that falls during a hurricane, increases the intensity of a storm, we can put numbers on it. Like the Pacific Northwest heat wave, oh, at least 150 times more likely because of climate change. Germany's deadly floods, seven times more likely. 
Australian bushfires, 30 times more likely. Climate change is loading the weather dice against us and it is affecting every aspect of our life on this planet. It affects our built environment, our infrastructure, our energy and water and electricity systems, our roads, our sewer systems, our homes. <clears throat> it affects our water supply and the quality of the water that we have. It affects the quantity and the quality of our food. And it affects our health. Burning fossil fuels produces not only heat trapping gases, it produces air pollution as well. And that air pollution is responsible for on average at least 9 million premature deaths every year around the world. That is double the number of annual deaths from COVID, from air pollution every single year. Climate impacts do not fall on everyone equally. They fall disproportionately on people who are already marginalized, who are already vulnerable. Whether it's women and children, especially in low-income countries, whether it's indigenous peoples and native communities, whether it's low-income communities and historically black and brown communities, many of which were already redlined due to racist lending and insurance practices in the last hundred years, they are more at risk from urban heat waves because they have less green area. They're more at risk from flooding and floodwater contamination because they live in more affordable, low-lying areas. And they often might have a garbage dump or a hazardous waste site located there because they didn't have the political clout to get it put somewhere else. Climate change is profoundly unfair. It affects all of us, but it affects those who are already marginalized and vulnerable the most. So this begs a question. Why aren't we acting at speed to fix this thing? So often we think it's because people aren't worried enough. And so we think, well, if we just scare the pants off them, that'll get them going. But I have some surprising news for you. Most of us are already worried. Polls from last year show that 70% of Americans are already worried about climate change. But 50%, half of us, feel hopeless and helpless. We don't know where to start. This is the real problem. Not that we don't think it's real, but that we're not activated. The biggest gap is not between those who do and don't accept the science. The biggest gap is between those who do accept the science and are worried about it and those who are activated. That gap is almost twice as big. So how do we tackle that gap? To put it a different way, we don't understand why it matters so urgently and we don't understand what we can do to fix it. So this is why we can't just talk about the science. We have to talk about why it matters and we have to talk about what we can do to fix it. In fact, those two things are more important than talking about the science. On the science, all we need to say is it's real, it's us, it's bad. And then we need to talk about why it matters and what we can do about it. Because you could say, I completely agree with the science, but if you don't know what to do and you do nothing, that's the same result as someone who says it's a hoax. Action is what matters. And how do we spur that action? By tackling the real issues. The first issue is something called psychological distance. We humans are really good at seeing risks as being far away from us in time or space, or being abstract rather than concrete, or saying, oh, it's somebody else's problem, it's not mine. We see this with climate change in spades. Here is a, a figure from the Yale Program on Climate Communication, where they ask people, all right, do you think it's real? Is it real? And this is showing results by county. They have a great website where you can zoom in on your county and you can zoom in on your congressional district if you're interested. Just Google Yale Climate Communication polling data or opinion data. Anywhere that's orange is greater than 50%. Anywhere blue is less than 50%. So people say, sure, it's real. And about the same number say it will affect plants and animals. Who's that? Not humans, right? So distant in relevance. Will it affect future generations distant in time? Yes. Will it affect people in developing countries distant in space? Yes. Will it affect you, no, people don't think it will affect them. This is a much bigger problem. 
So we have to bring this issue close. We have to talk about how it is now. It is here. It is concrete and it is relevant to me, whoever I am, wherever I live, whatever I care about, I am already being affected by climate change today. But then how do we spur action? The Intergovernmental Pan on Climate Change concluded its 1.5 degrees Celsius report with these words, which I feel are incredibly hopeful and incredibly motivational. They said, every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. We can make a difference, but how? Most of us don't know where to start. We don't know what to do. Well, we know what the big solutions look like. The big solutions look like stopping carbon from going into the atmosphere. How? Through efficiency, good old fashioned efficiency, and through clean energy sources. What else can we do? We can take carbon out of the atmosphere. It's not just about planting trees, it's about restoring wetlands. It's about conserving and protecting degraded ecosystems. And it's about farming, putting carbon back in the soil where we want it instead of the atmosphere where we don't, where it's an incredible fertilizer too. And we know that climate solutions are needed that build resilience, like greening low-income neighborhoods to reduce the urban heat island effect, and reduce flood risk, and clean up air quality, and improve people's physical health, and improve their mental health. You get the picture. There's benefits, benefit, benefit, and then, oh, it helps with climate change too. So, okay, climate change is here and now. It's affecting all of us. We know what we have to do to fix it, so why aren't we? It's because we lack something called efficacy. We don't think that we can make a difference. If we do think we can make a difference, that's when we act. And it makes sense, right? If you don't think what you're going to do is going to make a difference, why do it? How do we engender efficacy? How do we tackle psychological distance? How do we engender psychological proximity? And how do we build efficacy? The very first step is to do something that we're not doing. So I ended with this map, whoops, <clears throat> do you think global warming will harm you personally? And you can see this map is very blue, but there was another map that was even darker blue that I didn't show you yet. And this map is the beginning of the answer. This map asks people, do you ever talk about it? And the answer was no, people don't talk about it. And here's the connection. If you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you ever do anything to fix it? Talking about it is the first step that knocks over the first domino that then connects your head to your heart to your hands. What am I talking about talking about? I'm not talking about ice sheets, Antarctica, or polar bears. I'm talking about what's happening where I live. What's happening to the places I love, to the people I love, to the things that I love, and what we can do to fix it. And here's the amazing thing. You have such an opportunity to do that wherever you are. I was asked <clears throat> when I was in Iowa a little while ago, they said, how do you talk about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, you don't. You talk about corn. You don't talk about what's happening somewhere else. You talk about what's happening where you live. In Texas, I talk about cotton with Jack. In California, I talk about wildfires. Anywhere in the Pacific Northwest or the Northeast or the Midwest, you talk about floods. Big cities, we talk about our health and air pollution and extreme heat. We care about climate change because it affects every aspect of what humans need to survive and thrive on this planet. There is no one that you can't connect climate change to if you stop and take the time to figure out what they love, where they love, and who they love. So that's the psychological distance part. What about the solutions? How do we engender efficacy? By talking about what is already being done, and by showing people how they can add their hand to that giant boulder and get it rolling down the hill even faster too. Talk about 
again, how climate change affects us and what we can do to fix it. And that's why I am so excited about the Federal Sustainability Plan. <clears throat> because it isn't just about our carbon footprint. This is a great story that was written by a reporter called Emma Patty a number of months ago. And I loved the phrase that she used. It really embodied what I've been thinking about for a long time, but I had never used this word before. She said, if you really want to get, if you want to make an impact, don't focus on your carbon footprint, but rather on your climate shadow. What's the difference? Our footprint is our personal emissions. It could be us as an individual. It could be us as an office. It could be us as a household or a family or a school or a place of work. And it's important, don't get me wrong. But what's even more important is our shadow, the way we influence others, the way we engage others, the way we model change, the way we show people that really is possible to act. And who has a bigger shadow than the United States federal government? That is one heck of a shadow. And as Andrew just pointed out, he's been talking with dozens of other countries around the world about how their federal governments can have sustainability plans too. That is the shadow. But in order to have a shadow, you have to have the footprint too. And so that's why the federal sustainability plan is so important. It is the footprint that enables the government to stand and cast that shadow. So the federal sustainability plan was released in December, just a month ago. And when you read about it, it has so much potential. I mean, 300,000 buildings, 600,000 cars and trucks, annual purchasing power of $650 billion. That is huge. And what are they doing? They're going to 100% carbon pollution free electricity, 100% zero emission vehicle acquisitions net zero emission buildings by 2045. And I like the fact that there's shorter term goals in there too. Big fan of shorter term goals. Net zero emissions procurement, advancing environmental justice, recognizing that these impacts do not fall proportionally on everyone. And of course, building resilient infrastructure and operations because some of the impacts are already here today. What can we take from this? We can take stories. And so I was going through the website and I was looking for stories because I always love telling stories of what's happening in Texas. People are surprised to know that Texas has, um, well, they're probably not surprised that Texas has the biggest army base in the U.S. by land area, Fort Hood. But they're usually surprised to know that Fort Hood is powered 43% by clean energy or that Texas has the first uh, carbon neutral airport in North America, DFW, or that Texas gets 23% of its electricity from wind energy people are often surprised to know what's happening. So with the federal sustainability plan, there's already stories you can tell. Stories about the Boston healthcare system replacing their fleet, which also cuts air pollution, which also helps people's health. Stories about Air Force bases like Edwards Air Force Base putting in one of the biggest solar PV array projects in the country and creating a thousand jobs too. Notice there's always multiple benefits. Stories about the IRS saving money. Who doesn't like to hear about the IRS saving money? Normally they're collecting our money. It's great to hear about them saving money. $31 million of energy savings through improving the efficiency of their buildings. How do we engender efficacy? By telling people about what is already happening and about how they too can be part of the solution. We often think of climate change as, you know, just one more bucket we're trying to fill. I'm trying to fix this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem and oh, now I have to add an extra bucket. Climate change is not an extra bucket. The only reason we care about it is because it affects everything else we already care about. It affects our infrastructure, our economy, our energy, our water, our natural resources, our health, our food, our biodiversity, our conservation, and our justice and our equity. That's why whoever we are, whatever we care about, we are already the perfect person to care about climate change because climate change is not a new bucket. Climate change is the hole in the bottom of every other bucket we already care about. And if we don't fix it, we can't fix anything else. So the only question at this point in my mind is, 
What are we waiting for? Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, we, in addition to those um, inspiring words and um, uh, communications that I think as, as we play this role as the Chief Sustainability Office and, uh, and our agency partners throughout on this call, one of the really critical pieces here is how do you communicate clearly and well, um, and some great modeling here today through this conversation. We have time for um, about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of questions before we close. We have enough questions to fill that time in that we had over 100 questions uh, prior to our start here. Uh, and then thanks to uh, technology, we've got uh, plenty more in the chat. So um, I'll kick it off here with uh, picking up on a couple that we see received in advance. Um, and I'll couple these two for you, Catherine, and um, I'll, I'll add some direct federal sustainability, uh, I'll answer some direct federal sustainability questions along the way as well. Um, but two, I think from the, from the um, questions prior to the call, given your experience, what role does effective accessible communication play in advancing our climate change efforts? And how do we champion climate change in the age of misinformation? That's a great question. We live in an era of misinformation today, don't we? Where um, wherever we go, there's people sharing things about masks and COVID and vaccines and politics and climate change that just aren't true. And a lot of it is motivated by fear. The world is changing really quickly. It's very uncertain. A lot of people have experienced incredibly negative impacts over the last two years from the pandemic. And there is a lot of fear out there. And so that's why I think it's so important to focus so much on positive, constructive solutions that have benefits today as well as benefits tomorrow, showing people that there really are things that we can do to grow jobs, to invest in local communities, to save people money, oh, and to tackle the climate crisis at the same time. Things that people can agree on um, across the aisle. There's so many benefits people can agree on across the aisle. Things that local communities can agree on, things that can support low-income communities, marginalized communities, <coughs> other communities like woman-owned businesses and veterans. There's so many ways that climate solutions can benefit us. And really, we can come together on a lot of those, even if we might say, oh, well, you know, I'm not really worried about climate action. But yes, of course, I want local jobs or of course, I want more affordable energy or um, of course, I want to spur new innovation. And, not <laughs> and so if we can figure out what we most agree on, that's, I think, where the fastest action can take place. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'd um, adding in a. Uh, a question on the federal sustainability plan. There's a couple versions of this uh, in the questions, which is um, 2050 is a long time out. What are we doing between now and then? And one of the things I want to make clear, and Catherine made it clear through her examples of, of Fed action now, is that we are not only moving out for the long term to 2050 or the near term to dates like 2027, but the question before us is how do we move uh, with force this year. And so in places like zero emission vehicles, where the federal government has traditionally purchased under 1% of vehicles as zero emission vehicles, we're seeking to scale that up dramatically. And we're seeking to also, of course, provide the infrastructure charging that goes along with that. And so there's uh, places across those circles in the plan's design um, where we're moving out today so that we, when we get to those periods of 2030, 2027, um, it's, a, it's a climb up a, 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 a measured slope um, versus a moment in time that we need, need to uh, get to over, uh, over one year. So rigorously year by year, methodically year by year, we're gonna, we're gonna scale these solutions and those have already started. Uh, I am so glad to hear that. So in other words, what you're saying is you have a goal for every year. So so the big picture is maybe, you know, 2027, 2035, but you have a goal for 2022. Yes, exactly. And one of the um, cool things about the way that we've designed the plan, um, which is a bit of a departure from uh, prior years plans, is that um, we've we've uh, oftentimes it's been a, a straight up goal. We just set a number and 
ask our agency partners to hit it. And, and then during this um, approach, we've set these broader, longer term goals, but we're engaging agencies where they are and asking them how far they can go on their own, how quickly. And what we're seeing, not surprisingly, um, is agencies who come back and say 2027 is you know, too late for us. We're going to do all we're going to trans transition all of our uh, vehicles by 2025 or 2024. Um, so um, it's a really uh, exciting time uh, to uh, be working with this whole group on, on this plan. Um, back to you, Catherine, on another question, and this is um, um, echoed throughout, uh, you know, beyond speaking about climate change solutions in a person's day to day life. What are tangible actions that we can take? So having these conversations is the single most important thing we can do to start climate action. Of course, talking is not sufficient, but how do we do anything if we don't talk, if we don't communicate, if we don't connect with other people? So whatever it is you're doing, talk about it. And when people say, well, what's the best thing that I can do individually? My answer to that is do something, anything, and then make sure you talk about it. So it could be something that you do with your family or in your personal life or a choice that you make. Um, every year I adopt two new resolutions and some of them are really small, like feeding, you know, feeding the pets um, in uh, pet food made of invasive species <laughs> or cricket food or, you know, replacing my gas stove with an induction stove to reduce our air pollution inside the home, as well as to switch to our electricity powered by our solar panels. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small. But the most important thing is to talk about it. And I know that when I talk about what I'm doing in a larger group, if I'm part of a Rotary Club, if I'm part of you know, the PTA at my kid's school, if I'm part of the place where I work or the place where I worship, an organization I'm part of, when I say, hey, <clears throat> maybe we should consider doing this as a group, that's when my shadow kicks in and the impact is magnified by a factor of 10, 20, 100 or more engaging with each other and saying what could we do together is the most important thing we can do and when we talk about why it, climate change matters and what we can do to fix it we can talk about what we're doing in our personal lives we can talk about what our city is doing we can talk about what our state is doing we can talk about what big corporations are doing which is actually quite encouraging when you start to look at what some big corporations are doing and like i said you can absolutely talk about what your employer is doing um, and in doing so you're casting a huge shadow because so I work for the Nature Conservancy, and they're talking about how do, how do they replace their vehicles too. Well, if the federal government and if Amazon is already spurring and incentivizing the EV market through being such a huge potential consumer of these products, it's going to drop the price of the products for all of the smaller organizations who also want to do it. That's part of the shadow that you're casting. And so just sharing this good news with people is just incredibly important. And always looking for something new that you can do or something new that you can find out somebody else is doing that you can share and encouraging other people to add their hands to that boulder, like I said, which is already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It just isn't going fast enough. And to get it going faster, we need more hands. Thank you. And, um... Moving to another uh, Fed question, we've got a, I'll tell you, put a combo together here in that uh, the questions are, how do we as federal employees hold leadership accountable for executing climate change actions? And how can federal government employees become more directly involved with the sustainability goals of the current administration? Um, so I think that's a twofer uh, in combining those questions in that uh, I have the opportunity and privilege to serve in this role as chief sustainability officer for the federal government and we all have sustainability officers in every agency that we reside in. Um, it's sometimes and oftentimes uh, somebody who's wearing a few hats. Um, it's sometimes, but not all the time, the person who's um, got the lead management role. Um, but that person is a person that you can engage in their team. And what I've seen during, during our time over the past year is... Um, uh, We've seen this throughout the administration, but in our counterparts, um, there is a, a new enthusiasm and a new spirit and revived spirit of action. Um, and there are folks in agencies coming to them and raising their hands and saying, I want to be a part of this. And so I'd encourage you to figure out who your chief sustainability officer is, um, uh, engage that person, engage someone on their team and see how, see how you can uh, pitch in individually. 
That is fantastic to know. And that is a great example of people using their voices to say, hey, mm -hmm. what are we doing? What could we do more? Have we considered doing this? Like one of the questions is, have you considered switching to a remote optional workforce? Why don't we consider this? Let's think about this. Let's talk about it. And that's a way to use your voice because imagine if you yourself went to you know, virtual work half a week. Imagine if you talked to your agency and you allowed 3,000 people to go to virtual work half a week. The impact of that would be a thousand, thousands of times greater than your own impact. But what, how does any idea start? It starts with somebody using their voice to say, why don't we do this? Now, Andrew, if you don't mind, I'm going to flip the tables on you a little bit because the most upvoted question is one that I think you are best positioned to answer, not me. I was about to go there. <laughs> okay, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. You yeah. ask it. So, so this is something that I'm concerned about too because we've all seen how some administrations just are seem, you know, hell bent on absolutely turning everything 180 degrees from what the previous administration had. So, how can these great efforts, which I think will probably save money, they will empower people. They will also obviously clean up our air and our water and make the federal government a better steward of the taxpayer's money, I think is what these will do. But how can you ensure that these will persist and be followed up even through a change in the presidency and or Congress? Um, it's an important question. And in addition to its popularity during this conversation, uh, it's been a popular question throughout the, the past year. And it's, and it's a critical one. Um, and I'd say a few things about it. Um, one is what you're seeing um, through my part of the presentation on the sustainability plan, but even more so Catherine's. <laughs> so I'm gonna need your slides, Catherine, so I'm a better presenter and communicator. Um, and uh, that, that real things are happening now by the federal government and not just small things, but things at scale, some things that people don't realize like the, the uh, facts that Catherine quoted on, on, on federal action in Texas. Um, and so what's an important piece of the work that we're doing, we did last year, we'll be doing this year, we'll be scaling up over the next three years is how we uh, build the momentum, whether it's um, the zero emission fleet, and making progress on tens of thousands of vehicles and tens of thousands of chargers that would be put in over these coming years. Um, or the same with the carbon-free electricity, further investment in and acquisition of solar energy, um, wind energy, and other carbon-free electricity sources. What we'll, what we'll do is create a foundation that will be um, persistent in the years ahead. And we're doing it not in a vacuum, which is a really important thing to note. And Catherine made mention of that too. When you have the Amazons of the world and the FedEx of the world and the UPS, when you just think about fleet action, um, and when you have uh, numerous corporates and public sector entities moving rapidly on the carbon-free electricity front, we're creating a movement not only within the federal government, the federal government's providing this huge signal to uh, create, create that which would be very hard hard uh, to, um, to reverse. Um, and it will seem like, I think, an important, uh, important thing, and, and I had the opportunity to serve in the Obama administration where um, it was more challenging during that time to address these issues and confront these issues. And here we are four years later and four years later with significant climate impacts that we felt throughout last year um, and climate impacts on the way as we, as we live through 2022. So the urgency and of this moment is different. And I think that leads to direct action and, and direct, direct action that will, that will indeed be sustainable. I'm mindful of the time and I'm gonna uh, uh, go to one more question, Catherine, for you. Okay. Um, if you've got time for one more question. I do. And may I just say, I, li I like how you're, you're, you're making these efforts. You're trying to make them as sticky as possible, it sounds like. So it would be more work to actually you know, turn the Titanic around than it would be to just let the Titanic go its way. That's exactly. <laughs> um, um, just in moving through some of these questions, a lot of great uh, federal questions in the fed federal employee directed questions in the um, online version. So one thing that tells me is that there's hunger for this. And, and not only will we reconvene uh, with our friend Bill Nye, but we'll also uh, find opportunities uh, to do this um, throughout the year with more direct uh, engagement. Yes. Um, it sounds like a town hall would be a great idea just to talk about how federal employees could get more involved in this plan. It sounds like from all the questions, that sounds like a great opportunity. 
Agreed. Um, so I, there's different themes and flavors of this, and you you hit it in your your presentation, Catherine. But I'd give you another uh, opportunity to, to double down on us. How do you move from personal accountability to systemic change? Be a good oh, one to close I was us out. You on. would pick that question. <laughs> All right. So so I'm often asked, which is more important, individual actions or fighting for systemic change? And my answer to that question is yes, <laughs> because we need both. What is a system made up of? Individuals. So how does the system change when individuals call for that change? Yet at this point in time, and this I'm quoting Bill McKenna, the most important thing an individual can do is not be such an individual. Because here in the United States especially, there's a strong culture of being individualistic. And so because of that, when we talk about how we produce carbon emissions, we tend to immediately focus on ourselves, on our carbon footprint. And don't get me wrong, nobody likes a hypocrite. And there's all, th all of us have things we could do in our personal lives. And I do them myself, and I'm sure you do too. But I've done the math. And if all of us who are worried about climate change did everything that we could afford to do within this current environment, which is heavily skewed towards cheaper fossil fuels, fossil fuels are massively subsidized in the current market. If we did everything we could, that would only take care of less than a quarter of the problem. So that's why we need systemic change. So that if people are going to be driving to work, it's cheaper for them to do so either on public transportation or in an electric vehicle than it is in a gas powered car. Um, if people are going to, you know, um, uh, you know, it's already happened, replace light bulbs. It's a lot cheaper to replace it with an LED than it is with an incandescent bulb. We need to change the system so that the best choice is also the most affordable choice for everyone. And for that, we need individuals because our voices are what change that system. So do we need people doing things in their life, individual life? Yes. Do we need the federal government implementing policy? Yes. Do we need everything in between? Do we need cities? Do we need states? Do we need corporations, nonprofits, tribal nations, universities, churches? Do we need all of them? Yes, we need them too. And we are all part of organizations like that. So wherever we are, we can use our voice to advocate, to make our Rotary Club an even better adherent to the four-way test than it was before, to make our university an even better steward of their students' money and an even better provider of a sound education than it was before, to make our city an even safer place to live than it was before. Everywhere we are, we can use our voice to advocate for that change at every level because we can't go it alone, but together, I really truly believe we can do this. That is an excellent note to end on, and it also, uh, the individual and systems change goes directly to this conversation today and the ability of the of our federal employee colleagues here today to uh, be the individual participant in the systems change that we need because we are, as you've seen in these slides and in this conversation, the largest electricity consumer in the United States, the largest real estate owner in the United States, um, the largest fleet uh, uh, owner in the United States. And we do, we only make that change if we do it through a systems based approach. And we only do it through the people here calling in today and our other thousands of colleagues that will contribute to this. So with that, I would say deep, deep thanks again, Catherine, for your time and your efforts, not only today, but overall. And I would uh, pass us back to uh, Michelle, who's going to close us out. Thank you, Andrew and Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us today and for the inspirational presentation. Um, thank you to everyone who was able to take time out of your busy schedules to join us today. And uh, we hope to see you in April. Our next speaker will be Bill Nye. Uh, the date is TBD, but please uh, stay tuned. Have a look at our website for more information um, at sustainability.gov. I know Andrew is wanting to add something. <laughs> I was just remembering, speaking of sustainability.gov, um, we're going to uh, uh, copy down the questions we have here, and we're going to think of things like um, town halls that would be great ways for further federal engagement as we develop and execute this part of the agenda. Um, in addition to that, um, if you want to contact us directly, sustainability.gov is a place to go. And on the front page, you'll see a click for contact us, which allows you to email us. Um, just wanted to make sure that we got that in. Sorry, Michelle. Back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yes, please contact us. Um, I look forward to hearing your feedback about this speaker series. We want your ideas for future topics. 
Um, and so again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in April.